a long, long time ago, back in the altar, Hain, back in the old country, there was once a man who, after having a little Yom Kippur shloff, was heading out the door to return to synagogue for Ne'ilah services, the last great moment of prayer and devotion before the gates of righteousness and supplication close on the 10 days of tshuva. While he was grabbing his hat, he felt a tug at his coat. He looked down to see his youngest daughter staring up at him, her eyes smiling and a look of curiosity on her face. Tati, she asked, can I come with you to the synagogue for the evening prayers? The man smiled. Of course, he said, but you have to promise to sit quietly while we pray. No talking, no fussing, no asking to go home. Bring a toy or a book and be a good girl. The girl let out a delighted giggle, hugged her Tati's leg with a tight squeeze, then ran to her room to grab a toy, as her father had requested. The two of them walked together, hand in hand, and when they arrived at the synagogue, they found a little nook of space to stand and nestled close together amid the shuffling daveners as the Rebbe chanted the ancient and holy words. Whispering the Hebrew from his prayer book, the father looked down at his daughter with a smile on his face. She had her eyes closed up tight and she was rocking back and forth. How cute, he thought to himself. She's pretending to pray just like a real Hasid. But shortly thereafter, a sound of anxious murmuring replaced the Hebrew words of the Machzor. The din of the individual tefillah grew uncomfortably quiet. The Rebbe had stopped in the middle of his Ne'ilah prayer. Throughout the synagogue, the men looked at each other anxiously. Was the Rebbe okay? Should someone take over? Should someone intervene? Should someone help him? And the pause grew more and more uncomfortable, and yet the Rebbe stood there, still, eyes closed, silent. But then, piercing through the quiet, came a blasting, pure cry. The men looked around in shock, but none were as shocked as the father, who looked down in horror to see his daughter, her cheeks puffed out, blowing as hard as she could on the toy flute that he had bought her for Rosh Hashanah. The men stood, afraid to move a muscle, their eyes fixed on this little girl who had breached all sense of decorum and all sense of Jewish law with her need to play. But before anyone could say a word or snatch the flute from her mouth, the Rebbe picked up his prayer, once again rocking back on his heels and toes, his words even stronger and more emotional than before. When the service ended, he turned to the congregation to explain. As I was davening, I felt the gates of prayer were closed to us. But when that girl blew her flute, so pure, so honest, I felt them fling open. And then and only then were the words of our prayer able to rise to the heavens. And my dear friends, they did so as if they had wings. There are always points in my life when I think that I have this Judaism thing figured out when I go down some rabbit hole of theology and philosophy, of history and culture, and the logic of it all seems abundantly clear. The numbers add up the way that they're supposed to, and the proofs and the argumentation seem so sound that any refutation would feel weak or seem naive. But then I spend time with children. And that shaky edifice of certainty crumbles and falls back to the earth where it belongs. Because when I see how children experience this world, how they experience our tradition, how they experience one another, and how they experience God, it's humbling to a point of astonishment. And it's humbling because it's a reminder that if we are doing Jewish solely with our heads, if we are approaching our relationship to Torah and to holiness as if we were in a classroom or a lecture hall, then we are missing the point of this whole thing entirely. 
our children have this incredible way of seeing, of speaking, of questioning from a place of honesty and sincerity that we, somewhere along the journey of our lives, let slip away. Just recently on a religious school Sunday morning during tefillah, my teacher, whose name is Gabriel and happens to be three years old, told me that God is in his family because that's where people say, I love you most. God is in my family because that's where people say, I love you most. This isn't kids say the darndest things. This is profound. This is beautiful. A small sentence transcending a mountain of history, poetry, art, and thought. A few words that go far beyond anything and everything those fields of study could ever teach us. And they're important because those words are exactly why we're here in this place and in this moment. It's Rosh Hashanah. It's Rosh Hashanah. This is the kickoff of the Yamim Noraim of the days of awe. They're not called the days of maintaining the status quo. These days aren't about sitting on our hands and listening politely to liturgy and sermons. They're about transformation. They're about unsettling the very foundations of who we are. They're about throwing the entirety of our hearts and our souls into disarray so that we can find that pure note from our flutes that will fling the gates of prayer open and leave the world as it was, still and stunned. And the point of the story of the little girl, the point of Gabriel's insight into God's place in our lives, is that that note comes from a place that transcends our understanding of Jewish wisdom and spirituality. And that's hard for us. It's hard for us. It's hard for us as adults to hear that the Torah we need doesn't require rabbinic ordination and a command of Hebrew and Aramaic. And it doesn't need to speak from a place of obtuse wisdom or some esotericism that requires hours of conversation just to understand the mashma'ut, the takeaway or the meat of the message. The Torah we need is the Torah that comes from those who get it way better than we do. Whose words and expressions ring with an honesty and a purity that we know are true because we feel it. We feel those words. They give us chills. They give us goosebumps. They bring tears to our eyes because they make us feel a twinge of sadness in the deepest part of our being because we don't speak that way. We don't sing that way. We don't dance that way. We don't pray that way. But we used to. And the rabbis of the Talmud recognized that. And in an effort to show us the power of that innocent and honest theology, they explain in a midrash just what's at stake in identifying and uplifting that theology. In Shir Shirim Rabbah, a midrash on the poetry of the Song of Songs, the rabbis analyze the verse, Mashcheni Arecha Narutza, hold on to me as you go, and together let us run. And they ask, what could these words possibly mean? Why would it be that God wouldn't hold on to us? And the answer to that question becomes clear in the Midrash, which reads as follows. Shacheni Arecha Narutza, Amar Rabbi Meir, B'Sha'ah She'amdu Yisrael Lifnei Harsinai L'Kabel HaTorah L'Gomer. Rabbi Meir said, At Sinai, when the Jews were ready to receive the Torah, God said to them, Am I supposed to give you this Torah without any sense of security? Bring some good guarantors that you will keep it properly, and then I will give it to you. The Israelites reply, Our ancestors will be our guarantors. To which God says, Your ancestors... Your ancestors need guarantors themselves. Abraham questioned me. Isaac loved Esau, who was wicked, and Jacob thought that I mistreated him. So the Israelites offer a different guarantor. Our prophets, they say. To which God responds, I have complaints against them too. In Jeremiah, it is written, the shepherds sinned against me. 
And in Yehezkel, in the book of Ezekiel, it is written, Israel, your prophets were like foxes. And so the Israelites try one last time. Our children are our guarantors. To which God responds, now that's a guarantor. For as it is written in the Psalms, from the mouth of children and infants, you established O's strength. And this O's, this strength, is Torah. Now it's easy to miss the ikar, the essence of this passage, and pull from this text that our children are simply an insurance policy for God. But that's not what's going on here. God needs assurance, not insurance, but assurance that the Torah God is giving to Israel will not only be met and followed, not just expressed and taught, but lived and celebrated. And so God asks for a guarantor and is only appeased when the Israelites suggest that the guarantee, guarantor should be their own children. What makes them the promise of our future and the fulfillment of our claim to God's love and covenant? Not that they simply exist. Not that they are signs or symbols of continuity and survival. This has nothing to do with who they will be. It's about who they are right now. It's about the incredible beauty of that verse from the Psalms, Mipi olalim ve'enokim yasadata oz, from the mouths of children and infants, you established strength, you established Torah. Living Torah, celebrated Torah, flows from the mouths, from the hands, and from the feet, and from the hearts of our children. And when I say our children, I mean all of our children. This isn't a learning opportunity exclusively for parents and guardians. The Torah of our children isn't a question of biology or if we choose to have our own children or not. It's about us, whoever we are, not ignoring the sound of the flute, about actively listening to it and letting it inspire us to play a note of our own. It's about understanding that our children shouldn't be simply allowed to be in the sanctuary, allowed to participate in our prayers, our learning, and our rituals, but that they should be the focal points, the models for how to express the songs of our hearts and the questions of our lives. This isn't about them getting candy from the bima or having a place to sing songs in Hebrew and say Kiddush on Shabbat mornings. This is about us. This is about my teacher, Gabriel, teaching us that God is in the places where people say, I love you most. This is about my three beautiful nieces who have trouble taking their naps on Friday afternoons because knowing that it is almost Shabbat fills them with so much excitement and anticipation that there's no way their bodies will allow them to rest. My nieces, Eden and Sasha, who have transformed the way we do Natila Yadayim in our family because of what's, what because what was once a rote ritual has become, through their kavanah, through their intentionality, a ritual of singing, of laughing, an honest joy each and every week, as the conclusion, conclusion of Kiddush is met with a parodied version of when the saints go marching in. And we all get to sing, Oh, when the Jews go to wash their hands. Oh, when the Jews go to wash their hands. Oh, I want to be in that mitzvah. Oh, when the Jews go to wash their hands. It's catchy, right? <laughs> and this is about my teacher, Shoshana, who has the Siddur essentially memorized and who leads us each week at Seudat Shlishit, the third Sabbath meal here at the synagogue, in the most spirited Birkat Hamazon I have ever heard in my life. With so much joy, with so much ruach, with so much simcha, with so much spirit, that it should challenge each and every one of us to ask if we are passionate about anything as much as this young woman is passionate about saying thank you to God after eating some food. It's time for us to start seeing our children within and without the walls of our synagogue, not as distractions or inconvenient handfuls, and not even as cute gimmicks that we sprinkle here and there, but as our teachers and as our guarantors of Torah. Teachers who couldn't care less about who sits in which seat, 
If someone's not wearing a tie on Shabbat or Chas Vechalila, God forbid, if a woman is wearing pants, who would never even think about asking someone if they converted or if they're Jewish or not because of the color of their skin or how they look. Teachers who remind us that prayer is about talking to God with joy and with gratitude, with hearts overflowing, not mindlessly reciting words on a page. And teachers who want to have their questions about life, about death, about love and pain, about goodness and kindness, and about cruelty and hatred to be taken seriously. Not to be met with shrugged shoulders and cynicism that this is just the way that things are. Because that answer is not good enough. And it should never be good enough. Then, and only then, when we really see them, when we see them as the theologians and the poets that they are, as thoughtful and honest and holy, can we do this Judaism thing the way that we're supposed to? When we can learn from them and be reminded of how we used to be, so that we can pray, I mean, really pray to sing at the top of our lungs and dance without any sense of embarrassment or shame. When we can believe in the magic of our customs and our rituals and cleave to them like the diamonds of history and tradition they are. And when we can look around at the people around us and see safety, warmth, and family. Family. These are our tiny treasures. Not because they're cute, not because they will please God grow into Jewish adults, but because while the gates of prayer threaten to close on us and we stand idly by worrying about emails and phone calls, appointments and meetings, and all the other narish kite that comes with growing up, they're sounding that pure and holy note from their toy flutes. Rosh Hashanah and all of these days of awe are about transformation, about awaking the sleeping child within us, not just during the high holidays, but always, so that we can pray, so that we can question, and so that we can live with the love and wonder of life the way that we used to. And thank God we have the best teachers around us, reminding us that while it's hard to shake our embarrassment, our judgments, our insecurities, and our inhibitions, the reward for doing so is Torah. Torah in its purest form, and Torah the way that it was meant to be. Enough scolding, enough shushing, enough separating. Let's start learning. The gates are in front of us. Our children are sounding their notes. It's up to us to reach into our hearts, to pull out our flutes, and to play along with them. Mashkeni achrecha narutsa. Hold on to me as you go. And together, let us run.